After all these years, there's only one thing that makes me happy. One thing that can provide me with solace. Sleep without dreams. When I think back to my younger self, it breaks my heart. Just a little girl with big problems that no one could understand. We were real, and coming together again and again. Until finally it was too much. If these were her dreams, then they must follow her rules. Hello and welcome, your friendly neighborhood boomer here talking about a game that despite its neat ideas eventually fell into oblivion. Our story begins in 2004 when a Polish developer team unleashed Painkiller upon the gaming world. Based quite heavily on classic first person shooter elements and sharing some similarities with the then booming series Sam series, Painkiller pulled some tricks here and there. Serious Sam's vast landscapes and hordes of monsters have been replaced with more confined spaces and significantly less enemies, the colorful settings of ancient civilizations have been changed to gothic castles, cathedrals or spooky, hellish versions of modern day locations, presenting an altogether darker, more somber tone. And instead of time travel and hostile alien races, the story revolved around the battle between heaven and hell, with demons, angels and all that jazz. Or rather heavy metal. Is Painkiller better than Serious Sam though? It's hard to draw a direct comparison between the two, let's just say that they are kinda different, each with their own pros and cons, but both of them worth playing through at least once. Regarding the series' respective progressions, the Serious Sam games became more diverse and less consistent throughout the years, whereas the Painkiller series mostly stuck to its roots. Roots which have started to decay eventually. The second game in the series, Battle Out of Hell, released only a few months later, is an expansion pack yeah, they used to be called expansion packs, that was made by the original developer People Can Fly. This was a shorter but still exciting and definitely more challenging edition, just like expansion packs were supposed to be. Then in 2007 came Painkiller Overdose. New protagonist, new storyline and levels, lots of new enemies, redesign and some brand new weapons. Quite enjoyable if you ask me, although this was not developed by the original team but one Mindverse Studios hailing from the Czech Republic. The Painkiller Saga continued on, but this is actually where I draw the line. Partly because I feel like I'm digressing from the main topic, and mainly because Overdose was the last enjoyable Painkiller game. For the record, three more expansions followed, all developed by really really small teams and I cannot help but to interpret a deeper meaning into their titles. In 2009 they tried to resurrect the series, but to no avail. So in 2011 they hoped for redemption, but failing once more, so much so that near one year later we could consider these expansions a form of recurring evil, which led the series to... yep, hell and damnation. For now I will only say that in this reboot some of the original levels are simply not included, because the devs thought they are just not fun enough, and many levels are only accessible by purchasing them as DLC packs. Why? Honestly, why? Alright, I really did digress, sorry about that. Let's get back to Painkiller Overdose and its developer Mindware Studios. Overdose was their second game, the first one was Cold War, a kind of budget splinter cell wannabe from 2005. Two years after Overdose in 2009, they have released the almost identically titled Dream Killer, which at first sight looks like another Painkiller expansion or rather a full conversion mod, but truth is it's neither of these, so let's check it out for ourselves. Oh, and before we start, let me say that I find it ironic that unlike the first three Painkiller games, this one was not published by the same company. Just imagine, Dream Killer published by Dreamcatcher Interactive. Ah, so close. In Dream Killer, you play as one Alice Drake, a young woman who as a child has been tormented by vicious nightmares, until one day she kinda learned how to turn things around, and eventually became a psychiatrist specializing in phobias, nightmares and... Alright, basically she's cleaning people's minds by rampaging in their dreams with miniguns and grenade launchers. Damn, after such sessions these clients will sure need some... painkillers? I'm sorry. No! 
GOD PLEASE NO! NO! The story is being told by really nicely drawn comic style cutscenes. There are not too many of these but they look good and in all honesty I prefer these cutscenes over painkiller sometimes cringy 3D ones. A lot of people say that the voice acting is atrocious, I tend to disagree. First of all, the protagonist is voiced by Laura Bailey, who you might know as the voice of Blood Rain, for example. I think other voices are kind of fitting too, and oh boy, I've heard way worse voice acting than this, trust me on that. We've got to... I'll take you. No, Dr. Drake, we are going to the hospital. We're going somewhere else that you know very well. The levels are basically phobia-driven nightmares of different clients. You can see the case history of each client at the loading screen. There are 12 levels in total, with the last 3 levels being the nightmares of Alice herself. In the other cases you can discover ordinary phobias such as arachnophobia, the fear of heights or demons, as well as quite unique ones like the fear of machines, of kids, of forests, or the fear of going insane. It's uh, somewhat ironic, isn't it? Most of these phobias are portrayed quite well. An abandoned zoo overtaken by giant spiders and their webs, a seemingly infinitely tall tower that reaches up to outer space, creepy kids toys, a swampy forest, or a bizarre mental institute. There are some more ordinary levels too, such as an office complex, a factory, or a gothic castle. My favorite level is the penultimate one, which is a giant train, but in each wagon you'll find small reiterations of previous environments. In most levels there are some absolutely bizarre and unexpected sections, like when an elevator takes you to a small tropical island, or killing enemies while running around among giant human organs. As you could probably guess, the levels consist of several smaller arenas connected by linear corridors. The arenas are rather small and confined, much like in Painkiller, and of course there is no key or switch hunting, all you have to do is kill all enemies, then you can progress to the next arena. In the final level you have to destroy these orange tanks on two occasions, but that's pretty much it. The length of the levels are somewhat inconsistent, some of the more boring ones doesn't seem to end, whereas the most exciting ones tend to end quite abruptly. From time to time you will have to face gatekeepers, these guys will keep spawning enemies until they are destroyed. The end level boss fights are also no brainers, save for a few and the final boss they only need to be pumped full of lead. The majority of available weapons are revamped versions of the guns in Painkiller, the shotgun with the freezing projectile, the electroshock weapon, or the minigun rocket launcher combo which is almost identical to the original. As a starting weapon there's this handy flamethrower which is as useful as a butter knife because it has almost zero range. I mean, yeah you could damage a giant spider with a butter knife but you'd get hurt as well for sure. Its alternate fire mode is a telekinetic strike which can affect several enemies at once. Then there's the sunbeam which is the most visually pleasing weapon in my opinion and it's also really useful. It kinda reminds me of the demon head from Painkiller Overdose. Its alternative fire mode is quite unique, you can throw quote unquote happy thoughts which materializes sunshine and flowers and they also attract enemies. And when they clustered up like that it's time to toss a grenade at them from the dream cleaner which is our case in point grenade launcher with an exceptionally useful shockwave attack. For some bizarre reason you can only carry two weapons at a time, there you go, realism in a game where you fight monsters in people's dreams, uh huh. The method of picking up new weapons is really flawed one can say. Weapon pickups are these semi-transparent portals, just go through them and you switch weapons, which is fine I guess, except when you do it unwantedly and unexpectedly during battles. That's no good. By the way, all weapons have infinite ammo, which totally fits the previously mentioned and so-called realism with the two weapon limit, doesn't it? At least no ammo is needed, but most weapons have a cooldown or reload that in all honesty doesn't really pair well with this type of gameplay. It's annoying, slows the gameplay down from time to time, and it simply shouldn't be there, just like weapon reloads in Series M3. All weapons can be upgraded by picking up 10 golden dreamcatchers. Yep, pickups dropped by enemies are dreamcatchers by the way. Weapons can be upgraded 3 times and upgrades apply to all weapons. These upgrades generally make weapons fire faster and do more damage. They are quite visual and they look cool, like the small fire breathing lizard for the flamethrower, the minigun will get more barrels, the sunbeam becomes more complicated. If you die you lose one level of upgrade and also one continue, indicated by drops of blood near the health meter. You start with three continues but no worries, even after the third death you will start from the latest checkpoint and they are indeed plentiful. Killing enemies also fills up a berserk meter. If it's full you'll enter berserk mode which is visually reminiscent of painkiller's demon mode, although not as powerful. You move faster, do more damage, but you are not invincible. However, you can keep being in berserk mode by keep killing enemies, such rampages tend to be quite fun. Alright,
lied. I actually lied a bit when I said weapons have infinite ammo. In fact, the flamethrower consumes this so-called concentration, which refills over time. Another thing that's using this resource is the teleportation, and well, it's not really teleportation neither, it's more like a blink if you're familiar with World of Warcraft. Basically, you shoot out this projection of yourself and wherever it goes, you can teleport to that location. In the final level, at one point, you can only progress by using this ability, but nowhere else is it required. There is some potential in using it during fights, but to be honest, most of the times I kind of forgot that this thing is in the game. I would have been happier with the same old bunny hopping mechanic seen in Painkiller. Dreamkiller doesn't have such a thing, but in exchange the player character moves faster by default. From time to time you will come across these orange semi-transparent enemies that you seemingly cannot hurt. These bad boys are dwelling in the subconscious part of the mine and to kill them you have to enter it through the portals nearby. While in the subconscious you can damage all enemies but your concentration is slowly being consumed, just like being underwater with the concentration being the oxygen. Luckily enemies in the subconscious tend to drop concentration pickups and in general these parts are not too challenging. Of course using the teleport ability or the flamethrower while in the subconscious are genuinely bad ideas. Unlike looking around in the environment for secrets, Dreamkiller doesn't have too many secret places and as a unique approach the game does not tell you when you have found one. These secrets are mostly in hidden corners but the majority of them can only be found in the subconscious. This way previously closed doors open up or hidden walls disappear, revealing mostly health or concentration pickups, weapon upgrades or exclusive to secret places, a pickup that instantly upgrades weapons by one level. After completing the campaign you unlock three new game modes, a time trial mode which needs no explanation, then there's a single weapon mode in which you choose a weapon in the beginning and you cannot use any others. The last one is the berserk mode in which you are, well, you're constantly in berserk mode. Wow, I mean, I'm not sure any of these would make anyone give the game another go. However, let's be honest, at this point you probably think, wow this is like painkiller but with some extra goodies, not bad at all, right? Well. I'm really sorry to inform you that all of it sounds way better on paper than in action. And in this regard my main issue is the enemies. Save for very few monsters, most of them are relentless bullet sponges, even the smallest spiders can absorb a ridiculous amount of bullets, and let's not even talk too much about the electro gun, even fully upgraded it sucks so fucking bad. Sometimes you have to destroy enemy spawn points such as these asylum beds or these small junk heaps that spawn robots. Even such objects can take quite a beating and you cannot damage them immediately. For what reason? I don't know. Sometimes the arena in which you have to fight is too small, like here, look how many enemies are there, not to mention the spawn points. Uh, then these flying worms, oh boy do I hate you all. These come in different flavors and they are pretty hard to hit if not with the sunbeam or the electrogon, the latter only being useful against these enemies mind you. So these worms can bombard you with an area attack which is amazingly annoying. But what really made me lose my shit was the forest level. So first of all, bees as enemies. Ordinary run of the mill goddamn bees as enemies. But wait, there's more. These living trees, well, these ones also have an area attack which is kinda like this. What are these trees preparing for? And in this section, where these wooden boys cannot be bothered by the fact that they are actually burning, they are carpet bombing you, all the while you cannot really dodge them because the fires on the side will burn your ass. <laughs> then later in the cave, because we all so love these boys, just, uh, just listen how they were constantly nuking me with their attacks. Fuck off already. Visually Dreamkiller is nothing too special, many people have called it a downright ugly game but I strongly disagree, for a 2009 budget title it's actually up to par I would say. Weapon models and upgrades are wicked good, levels and environments are also solid in most cases, like the cocoons hanging from the ceiling of the train wagon, an icy temple, burning forest, medieval castle, hot air balloons flying in the clouds, many small details that actually count. The character models are also cool, but consistency is a weird thing. I mean, it's really hard to stay consistent when all levels are vastly different in style and setting, but there are some recurring enemies, especially in the early levels, which doesn't make much sense and these are a bit generic or out of the context. For example, the office zombies and these bigger grunts appear in the office and the factory as well. I have no idea how these small imps fit into the icy level and why on earth are the final bosses are also these guys. Oh, and these doggos look familiar? Yep. 
100% copy and paste straight out of Painkiller. Nothing is too outstanding in the effect department either, basic explosions, blood splashing on the screen when you're too close to the fray, and sometimes enemies fall apart in a rather laughable way. However, I for one am someone who praises gameplay and atmosphere above all, so all in all I was kinda satisfied with Dreamkiller's visuals. More or less, yeah. In the audio department things also look kinda bland. I loved Painkiller's audio, I believe its music was just as iconic as the game itself, with its heavy metal riffs and spooky ambient tunes. In Dreamkiller the music kind of went by me unnoticed, it is there and no way I would call it horrible but it's just too okay-ish. Definitely not something I would listen to it in my free time, let's say. The weapon sounds are fine, especially the shotgun sounds nice and meaty, however enemy voices are disappointing to say the least. In Painkiller I loved how the knights or the biker demons were yelling at the player. Hell, do you guys remember these claustrophobic corridors at the docks with all those drunken sailors? That's exactly what I was missing while playing Dream Killer. Sometimes the silence from the enemies kill the atmosphere that which a genuine setting has built up nicely beforehand. What a shame. Alright, so if you, despite all its flaws, still want to give Dream Killer a try, I have some bad news. The game has been taken off of Steam for several years now for reasons unknown, and it's not being sold digitally anywhere else. Nonetheless, you can easily find it online. The version I have threatened me with not saving my progress, but it's not entirely true, so don't worry. What you should worry about is the factory default 40 FPS frame rate cap. To enjoy the game in a smooth 60 FPS way, all you have to do is to find the game's config file in the documents folder and add these two lines at the end. Voila and enjoy. Many people still consider Dreamkiller as part of the Painkiller series. That's total bullshit. Obviously they are the same family tree, but there's an undeniable gap between them. Dreamkiller definitely wanted to stray from the beaten path by bringing in some fresh new ideas, but at the same time it changed some things that shouldn't have been changed. Don't fix what's not broken, they say. In spite of all this, I appreciate the effort and creativity, it's obvious that some serious work has been put into making this game. The general opinion about it was quite negative, but I personally believe that they've been a bit too rough to it. Dreamkiller is like the little sister to Painkiller, who's always gonna stay in the shadows of the older brother, but after seeing how Overdose turned out, I kinda understand the enthusiasm of the devs and despite not being up to par with Painkiller, Dreamkiller ended up being a nice effort. Especially if you look at how terrible the other Painkiller expansions were. At least it carried the legacy in some way. Long story short, if you like Painkiller, give this one a try too. It's worth playing through at least once, just don't have too high expectations. So that was it, thanks for watching, I hope you all enjoyed the video, more reviews to come in the near future, stay safe, be well, your friendly neighborhood boomer signing out, cheers.